Last week, we talked about preparing. We talked about how important it is for us to prepare. We talked about how even Jesus prepared, how he went out into the wilderness. When we started off in, in the first 13 verses here in Mark 1, how he came and he was baptized in obedience, went into the wilderness. But the thing is, is that we can often get stuck preparing. And that's how I want to start today. I shared with you here uh, over the last few weeks, last few months really, about a, a project that I was doing at my house. Uh, my wife and I, we were working on renovating our kitchen. We needed to do some things with our kitchen, so we worked on renovating it. And I'll tell you, the first few months when I was working on that kitchen, I, I kind of enjoyed it. I liked seeing the transformation and what we were doing. But I, I've got to admit something to you today. Yeah, the last couple of months, I did not want to do it. I did not want to do it at all. It was getting old. We had been doing it for so long. And so, you know what I did? I kept using an excuse. And I know my wife, Adriana, could see right through it because it was pretty obvious. But I keep saying, well, I don't have everything we need to finish it. Now, the truth is we did. It was, most of it was sitting out in the garage. So the truth is we did have everything. But, but I kept saying, well, I, I still need this. And so I would find that this one little thing to be a reason for me not to go and do something with the kitchen that day because I didn't feel like doing it. And, and, and it got me to be thinking as I, was, as I was looking at the passage we're going to go through here in a minute that so oftentimes we can get ourselves stuck in the preparing process. Oh, I, I just need this little thing or I just need that to be able to accomplish the next thing that God has for me in my life. I mean, think about it. Maybe Maybe at home, maybe we, we get down about something around the house, and so what do we do? We, we think, well, I'm not ready, and when, when you're really ready, what happens? Like me, you just don't want to do it, or, or maybe at work. Maybe at work, there's this project or this task that you have to do, but you've held off on it. Why? Well, I'm, I'm not quite ready for it yet. I'm not, I'm not quite ready to do that. I've got to get this in place in order for it to be done, and, and the fact is sometimes there's a little bit of fear we get a little bit of scared. Maybe that's why we don't do it. I mean, for our students today, maybe it's school. Maybe there's a sport or a class that maybe you don't want to join or be a part of because you're not quite ready for it yet. And so we use this, this idea of getting ready as maybe a reason not to do something. Maybe for some of you right here in the church. Maybe the same things happen. Maybe, maybe you've studied God's Word, and, and, but, but what do you say when somebody comes up to you and asks you a question about it? Well, you say, well, I'm not quite ready to share with the Word because I don't know enough. See, a lot of times, I think we make the mistake of saying that we are not ready or we're not prepared, and we use it as an excuse to not move into the next chapter of life. Now, again, I'm not up here today saying that preparation should be something that we just go through quickly. We saw last week how important preparation is and that sometimes it takes time. I mean, it was 30 years before Jesus began his earthly ministry. But sometimes we do make the mistake of saying, I'm not quite ready yet, when really we are. And, and that brings us into this passage today because have you ever considered that Jesus could have maybe been overprepared. I mean, maybe he could have gone to the desert and he knew what was about to happen in his ministry. And so he's like, oh, you know what, I, I don't really know if I want to do that yet. So I'm just going to stay out here in the desert for a few more weeks. I'm going to stay away from what God's calling me to do because, wow, there's going to be a lot required of me. And so I'm just going to stay out here. But that's not what he did. He came back and he began his ministry. See, we know that Jesus is God. The scripture teaches us that. So you might be tempted to say, well, of course Jesus would have prepared. He's God. He, he would have never done things incorrectly. But we can't forget that Jesus also had a human nature. And that human nature was always tugging at his divinity, at his, at his, as his, his nature of God. And, and it was trying to, to pull him into some of the, the habits that we often succumb to. And one of them could be this, is that sometimes we are afraid to step out even when the time has come. And so what I want us to think about today is how do we get unstuck? Because maybe some of you today 
are stuck in something. Maybe it's something at work. Maybe it's something in your family. It could be in your marriage with your kids. You've kind of gotten into a rut. And maybe you're thinking, well, okay, well, wait a minute. I'm not quite ready to get out of that rut yet. I'm not quite prepared to move on to the next thing in life that God has for me. And so we use what can be a very positive thing, preparation. We use preparation as an excuse not to act. I've been guilty of that myself. I'm sure in my life right now, I'm guilty of it right now. I, I'm always, I'm always um, straight up with you when I speak. You know, I, I try to my best to follow the Word of God and to live out the Word of God, but the fact is I'm, I'm broken and I'm a sinner just like you. And, and some of these things that as I read through every week, I'm like, okay, Danny, how can you talk about this when maybe you're struggling with this a little bit yourself? And, but I think that that's what maybe makes the word, as I study it, 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 it's more real because it shows me that I am missing the mark. And maybe I'm not stepping up and maybe I'm not acting. Maybe I'm allowing myself to remain stuck when God wants me to move on to that next chapter. And so today, let's go ahead and go to the word. Because in Mark chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 14 through 28. We're going to see what Jesus does as he as he comes back from the wilderness, it says in verse 14, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is what? What does it say? The time is fulfilled. You know what? Another way you could say that. The time has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. See, that's what we see here in these first two verses, the importance of recognizing when the time has come. See, the work of John the Baptist had come to an end. We read in some of the other Gospels of what happened to John. He was arrested. He was eventually executed. And his time had come and ended. And now Jesus' time had come. And it was time for the, for the crescendo of history to take place, for Jesus to come onto the scene and to share with them who he is, that he was the Christ and Lord, that he is the Messiah. And so the time had come, and then we see here this word, this word that is, we, we touched on a little bit last week, the word gospel. In the Greek, the word euangelion. The word gospel. And it's really interesting, this word gospel, because it, it really lies at the very center of, of what all of the book of Mark is about through all the Gospels and really the entire New Testament. And you could even argue back in, even into the Old Testament. This word gospel is often connected with, with three words throughout the New Testament that I think we should know today. See, oftentimes the word gospel is connected with the word truth. I want to share with you some passages that show this. Uh, let's bring that up here. It says, in, uh, it says in Galatians 2.5, it says, We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth, so that the, fill it in there, the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you or that it might remain with you. See, the gospel is truth. The word of God is truth. It's unchanging. It's always the same. So when we hear Jesus talk about the gospel, we know that it's something that will always stand the test of time. No matter what generation comes, no matter the generations that have come before us, that it stands true. We, we also know that the gospel brings us hope. In Colossians 1.23, it says, If you continue in your faith, established and, fir and firm, not move from the hope, there it is, the word hope held out in the gospel. The gospel gives us hope. It's the good news of Jesus that he has come and given his life for us so that we can be saved, so that we can have hope. And that hope, just like truth, never changes. It's not like this, that, that God made a, our salvation with an expiration date. We also see often in the New Testament that the gospel is connected with the word promise as well. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and what? And shares together in what? In the promise in Christ Jesus. It's a promise that God will keep. Now, when I look at these first three words here that we've looked at, truth and hope 
and peace and promise. <laughs> those, are, those are things that are really hard to find in this world, aren't they? It's really hard for us at times to discern what is truth. I mean, just go on social media, goodness sake. We hear this term that's being floated around all the time, right? Fake news. Well, how do we know what fake news? It's really hard to tell sometimes. And, and, then, and then the same thing happens when it comes to hope. We oftentimes put our hope in people or a policy. And then those people and those policies, what do they do? They let us down. They, they seem like they work and then they don't. And in Ephesians 6.15, it talks about the gospel being connected with peace. It says there, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. All of us are seeking out peace. And it's really hard to find it. Maybe we think we'll find it in a spouse or a friend or, or a job. If I just had that job, I'm going to find peace. Promises. <laughs> we all know that not only have others broken their promises toward us, but we've broken our promises toward others. But see, what we see here is that the gospel in its truth and in its hope and in its peace and its promises, that they will stand the test of time. That no matter if we can't trust or believe anybody or anything else, we can trust that what Jesus is about to say, as we're going to see here in the Gospel of Mark as we go through it over these months ahead, that we can see, that we can rely on this, no matter what happens in the world around us, no matter what happens in our families, in our workplace, that we can trust what Jesus is going to say. And, and something else that we see about the Gospel is that it's connected with immortality. In 2 Timothy, it says, But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. See, the gospel not only gives us this, this hope and this truth, right, and, and the peace and the promises that we need in this life, but even in the one to come. Because it's through the gospel that we find salvation. And that's the last word. In Ephesians 1, it says, And you were also included in Christ, what? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, which was the promised Holy Spirit. I'm sure we've all heard this word gospel before. We've probably heard it, if you've been in the church since you were young, you've heard it since then. But I don't know that we fully realize how ingrained and intertwined in, in the whole biblical message, in the whole Bible, of how ingrained it is. This word gospel, it is so, so important, and as we could see here with these words. Now, Jesus came to give us the good news, the euangelion, the gospel. But there's something else here that's really important, too. And the, and the second, a second idea that Jesus came was to call us to repentance. Look what he says there in verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So what do we do? We repent. Now, I don't know, when you hear the word repent, um, I, I've heard a lot of definitions. I always find it interesting when I talk to kids, when they hear this word repent. First of all, most kids don't even understand what repent is. But what's even more interesting is that a lot of adults don't. Because a lot of times we think that simply repentance is just saying that we're sorry. I'm sorry. And, and, and while that's definitely a part of repentance, there's more to it than that. I, I found this uh, quote from a, from a commentator this week, William Barclay, that I thought was really, really good in it. And it explains often what happens when we say we're sorry. It says, many people become desperately sorry because of the mess that sin has gotten them into. But they know very well that if they could be reasonably sure that they could escape the consequences, they would do the same thing again. It's not the sin that they hate. It's the consequences. See, that's often what happens when it comes to repentance. Jesus doesn't want us to hate the consequences. He wants us to hate the sin. But see, in our world today, I, I do feel like we, we do tend to hate the consequences that come from our bad choices. We talk about that a lot more than about the sin itself. And so when Jesus comes, he says, yes, I'm bringing you the good news. It's going to bring truth and hope and peace and, and promise and immortality and salvation into your life. But 
but for you to truly accept the gospel message, you have to make room for it in your life. And it starts with repentance, of truly being sorry, truly going in a different direction from the sin that is prevalent in your life. Allowing Him to transform you and to change you. And then finally we see another word that pops up again and again throughout the gospel. And that is this word believe. What is belief? Simply put, belief is taking Jesus at His word about what he says about himself, and you know what, what he even says about you. Now, many of us in here today, we can find it kind of easy to accept what Jesus says about himself. We, we really like the part about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. We like the part about him rising again and promising the same for us. But where it becomes difficult is believing that what Jesus says about each of us, about you and me, believing what he says about us to be true because it can be hard. Sometimes it can be hard for us to accept that we're sinners. Sometimes it can be hard for us to, to accept that we're like what, what the commentator shared there that I read with you a minute ago, that, that we're more focused on the consequences of sin than hating sin itself. But for us to understand and truly embrace the gospel, we have to also embrace and understand who we are as humans. And really, that's what Jesus' ministry was about. Jesus' ministry was showing us who we are and that we need help. We need the gospel. See, Jesus didn't just come in and say, hey, you need this gospel, you need this good news. He presented to us the problem and the reason why we need it. And that's what he's saying here in verse 15. Now let's keep reading here, because if you go on to verse 16, it says, as Jesus was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, hey guys, you know, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so what did they do? Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And then he went on a little bit further. And he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately, what did he do? He called them too. And, and what did they do? They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away to follow him. You know what? The time has come for you and for me, for all of us, to heed these words that Jesus calls out to us. The same ones that he called out to them when he said, come and follow me. See, the true power of the gospel message, understanding the truth of who we are, means that we have to follow after Jesus. See, when Jesus called these, these men to, to follow him, the, the mission had begun. The time had arrived for, for them to go out into the world and, and with him share the gospel. So who does Jesus go to? What's really interesting is he goes to fishermen, right? Of course, right? That would be the very people you would think of. Uh, you're the Messiah. You're going to go out and share the most important message in all of human history. Yeah, go down to the lake and pick up a couple fishermen, and you're going to go out and tell the world about it. Makes sense. God does a lot of things that to us doesn't make a lot of sense. But if we look back now, it made a lot of sense, didn't it? Because here we are. Here we are. You know, in this region that Jesus lived, fishing was big. Uh, one of the uh, ancient historians, Josephus, said that on, on, the, on the lake, the Sea of Galilee, every day, over 330 boats would be out on this lake fishing. It was a huge industry in the area. Fishing was, was what their lives centered around. As a matter of fact, there's even evidence that a lot of the fish, they were able to get the fish all the way to Rome for people to eat of the fish from the Sea of Galilee and Rome. It was a humongous industry. So why would Jesus go here? Why would he go to this lake where, where these fishermen are? Of course we know that he grew up in the region, but, but I mean, he could have gone somewhere else, couldn't he? Here, here's some things maybe you've never realized. There was a couple things as I studied through it I'd never really thought of before this week. We see here that Jesus, what did he do? He called ordinary people. He called people like you and me. 
I like what somebody once said. They said, we should never think so much of what we are as of what Jesus Christ can make us. That's why he chose the ordinary. See, when we're ordinary and we're humble, Jesus can make something of us. That's why repentance is so important. Because it realizes, we realize we need help. But there's something else that I never thought of before. Maybe I should because it's totally obvious. Did any of you notice when you read through that that Jesus called these men in the middle of a work day? I, I never really thought a whole lot about that before. What does Jesus do? He goes and he calls ordinary people and he goes out into an ordinary day with them and he calls them to follow him. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that we can follow him too in our ordinary day. Sometimes maybe we think, well, I've got to go down to the church to really be able to pray or, or to really re read the Word of God. And, but right here we see Jesus is calling them to follow him right there in the middle of his work day. Now, something that I've always wondered about is, really, these guys just follow Jesus? He just walks up. They didn't even know who Jesus was. He just walks up and says, hey, guys, come follow me, and they just did it. I find that, I find that very, very unlikely. We read here that Jesus had been preaching for some time. We're not entirely sure how long, but he had been preaching in the area for some time. So assuredly, they had seen Jesus preach and teach. And you know what happened? Jesus called them after he had planted the seed in their hearts. And now they were willing to allow that seed to grow by following after Jesus. And, and what Jesus did that day is something that we all long for in our lives too. It's something that he gave them and that is that Jesus gave them a mission for their life. Some of you today, you might feel kind of like, okay, what am I supposed to do? I, I'm totally lost here. I, Jesus has a mission for you. Not only is it to grow you, but in your ordinary day, like he did for, for his disciples, He's given you a mission to share the gospel, to share the good news through your words, but also through your deeds. And that's what these disciples would learn over the coming years. He didn't give them a mission that was going to be easy. They had to give up a lot. But they were willing to give it all up because this mission was too important. And, and I really appreciated what Kevin shared with us during communion because the fact is sometimes for us it can be too easy to follow Jesus. When Jesus called these disciples, this was not easy. They left behind their occupations, their families, to learn what it means to be more like Jesus. And look what happens in verse 21. It says, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he began to teach. And, the, and those in, there in, in the synagogue were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not like the scribes. And just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet. Come out of him. And then throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed that they debated among themselves, saying, what's this all about? I'd be asking the same question. They said a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits. And what do they do? They obey him. And immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. See, when I look at this passage, I, I realize that the time had come for Jesus to share the gospel. And it means that we have to follow after him, but also we see that it means going beyond just words. Jesus showed through his ministry. That's why the miracles that we're going to read about are so important, because it shows that he has not only wisdom, but he has power. And when you put those two together, and his truth, it changes lives. You know, Capernaum, and we're going we're gonna to run across Capernaum uh, several times as we go through, through the book of Mark. Capernaum was the central 
headquarters, I guess you could say, of Jesus. Most people think that it was Capernaum where Jesus lived. Uh, where he kind of centered his life around. We know the, the apostle Peter was from Capernaum. I've got some pictures. I thought it would be helpful to kind of show you what Capernaum looks like today. Um, Capernaum was, a, was, relatively speaking, in that period of time, a, a pretty big town. It was a town of about 1,500 people. So you know what? It was kind of around the size of Cambridge City. Okay? So Capernaum was around the size of Cambridge City. It was right on the Sea of Galilee. And here's what it looks like from the Sea of Galilee. It was kind of built in this region. Again, Capernaum, there's not much there anymore. There's a, couple, there's a church. There's ruins that are there. Here we'll show another picture. And this is, a, this is a place that is extremely important. This is the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, the synagogue that's there, this part here, this upper part, was actually built later. But if you go down one layer, and this picture doesn't show it, but there, the, the actual bedrock, the actual foundation of the, t of the synagogue that Jesus walked into in this story still exists today. Still there. So he walks into this synagogue. Oh, and one other picture. There's a building that's now built over this. They are almost 100% certain this was the house of Peter. They found some inscriptions that says that. So Capernaum was a really important place, and Jesus walks into this synagogue. And, and a synagogue, just so you know, was, was not maybe what you would think it is. A synagogue was, was a place of teaching. There wasn't like in a church or many churches, there wasn't like a permanent preacher or teacher. People would come and share, and so that's what Jesus did. But what was different about Jesus is he spoke with authority. He didn't quote other experts. <laughs> he didn't say, well, this rabbi said this or this. He was the authority. And that's what threw them off. That's, that's what they could not quite get. But that's why the story of him rebuking this man in the synagogue is so important because he backed it up with action. He showed that he had power. Everyone in the room would have known that Jesus had this authority. And even the man who was demon-possessed knew Jesus had authority. I, I like what it says here. If you look, if you really dig deep um, in, in verse... Um, Verse 24, it says, what business do we have with each other? If you put that in the vernacular, kind of what he's saying here is, why are you getting up in my business? Okay, that's what he's saying. I mean, he's mad that Jesus has come and confronted him. He was comfortable in this. But Jesus wanted something far better for him. I like what somebody said. Jesus blew them away with his preaching and put the fear of God in them through his miracles. <laughs> Because that's true. So we see here the time had come. The time had come for Jesus to act, for others to follow him, for their moment in time to act. And he backed it all up. With, it was more than just words to him. We have to live it out with actions. And so that brings us to our point today. The point from this message is this, is that moving forward means that we have to take that first step. And I want to ask you this question. What has been holding you back? What has been holding you back? You know, as I look at this story, and I look at, as I look at Jesus, I realize that there are some things that could have held them back. You know, the disciples, they could have held back from following Jesus out of fear. Afraid of what this was going to look like. I bet right now in your life today, there is something that you know God's calling you to. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's uh, something in your walk with Jesus personally, your individual walk with Jesus. Maybe it's within the church. Maybe it's even within a relationship. There is something that God is calling you to, but fear is holding you back from taking that next step. And, and, and it begs the question, is the fear going to be bigger than what Jesus wants to do in you? I mean, that's kind of what happened here with this, with this man, this demon-possessed man. Was it going to be... The possession that he was going to continue to live in? No, Jesus said, I've got something better for you. Jesus has something better for you and me. I know in my own life, fear has usually been the biggest reason why I don't step into that next chapter, into that next place in life. I'd like to say that it's because I'm, I'm spending time preparing, but a lot of times God's already prepared me. It's fear. Maybe we don't take that job that maybe God is calling us to do because 
because of fear. Maybe we don't share our faith because we're afraid of rejection. Again, that's fear. Maybe we don't confront an attitude or a problem in our families. Why? Because, well, it might bring up some things, bring up fear. But you know, there's something else that's maybe even more insidious. A lot of times we're just apathetic. Apathy can also be a really big issue. You know, if you go back to the very first sin, Adam and Eve, we see apathy. We see Eve that takes the fruit, and what does Adam do? Rather than confronting her and saying, this is wrong, and we should not be doing this, what does he do? He just goes along with it. He just goes along. Goes along for the ride. In our men's group this past Monday night, we talked a little bit about that. How as men, and all of us can be prone to this, but as men, sometimes we can be a little apathetic. We just kind of go along with the flow. Sometimes we just don't want to work harder. Maybe it's not fear or apathy. Maybe, and I know this might be hard to hear, and you know what, I've been guilty of this myself. Maybe you're just lazy. I'm just going to be right up front with you. Maybe you're just lazy. Maybe you just don't want to do it because you know it's going to require something of you. That's not preparation. <laughs> Laziness isn't preparation. God is asking us to step up and to step out. Remember what God has promised to you. We, we read through some of these promises of the gospel, of the, of the truth and the peace and the promise that it brings us, the immortality, the salvation. God sees something in you today. And he wants to do something in you today. But you've got to be willing to step out and you've got to be willing for him to work through you. You know, when he asked Peter to follow him, he saw a man who was filled with passion. And that passion would come out, not always in the best way, but it was through passion, Peter's passion that the church grew. And through the other disciples and their passion that the church grew. God wants to use the gifts that he has given you for his glory but you have to be willing to step up. I have a feeling that for many of us, the time of preparation has come to an end. God wants us to step out. You have to get over yourself and realize that God has something for you. I liked what Martin Luther King Jr. once said. He said, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. I love that. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the the whole staircase. That's, that's kind of where some of us are today. We're like, well, I don't see the whole staircase, so I, by golly, I'm not going to take the first step. God's calling you to take the first step, and then he's going to show you the next step, and the next step, and the next step. See, the disciples who followed Jesus, what did they do? They looked at Jesus. They saw the first step, and they followed after him, and they left it all behind and so my challenge for us today and this week is what is something you've been sitting on for a while where you're waiting for the right moment? Is that really the reason? Is that really the reason why you're holding back? Three, just three quick questions here. I'm not going to dig too deep into this because I think these are questions you have to ask and answer yourself, but... First, I want to ask you, where are you at today? What is going on inside you today? What's going on in your family today? What's going on in your work today? Where are you at right now? You might think, well, that, you know what? I, I know myself, we get so busy with our days, with our weeks. I, have you ever gotten to like Saturday and like, oh my goodness, how do we, how is it Saturday already? I'm sure all of us, I caught myself saying that yesterday. We don't stop and look at what's going on within ourselves because we're so busy doing everything else. Where are you today? And then the next question is, what are you being called to? God's placed a calling in your heart. I have no doubt, all of you. Now, it may not, you know, when we hear this word calling, oftentimes it's connected to preachers, and I absolutely hate that because everybody has a calling. God has called all of us. What is he calling you to? And then finally, how long is it going to be until you say yes? 
I want to challenge you today. Don't let your insecurities hold you back. You know, one time there was a, it was a man who was visiting a local department store with his wife. They had just purchased uh, uh, some luggage. They bought a cooler, and he browsed in the shoe department waiting for his wife to finish the rest of her shopping. And a clerk asked if he could be of assistance to him, and the man said, no, thank you. He says, I'm just, just looking through shoes. I'm just waiting for my wife. And at that point, there was another man that was also walking in the shoe department. He says, hey, I'm waiting for my wife too, but I never thought to bring lunch in an overnight bag. You know what? Some of you today are carrying your overnight bag. And you are not willing to put it down. Because you don't want to take that step moving forward. See, acting in the right moment opens up the future for you. Just think what could happen in your family if you would step out. And rather than just being apathetic or fearful, that you would maybe confront maybe an attitude or some things that are going on in your family that are negative, that God wants to go in a different direction. Imagine what could happen in your family if you did that. Or even at work. What if you stepped up and did something that maybe makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable? Or, or maybe you kind of confront maybe an attitude that's been there. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but... But what could change? What could that look like? See, today I, I want to just encourage you to think of something in your life that could be so different. Just imagine that with me. Something that could be so different if you would just step up and allow Jesus to lead you in that. So today I want to just close with this. Is that you have been waiting long enough. And Jesus invites you to walk with him. So go and see what he will do in you.